Right, uh, good morning everybody. It's uh, 10 o'clock and uh, welcome to uh, uh, this Countryside Rights of Way meeting. Um, we'll start off please with apologies, Kirsty. Um, so we've got apologies from Councillor Abrahams, Councillor Hudson and Councillor Pritchard. Good, good, okay. And, and we've also got uh, uh, enough councillors to be core in attendance. Right, that's good, excellent. Um, item number two, please, is declarations of interest in accordance with Standing Order 16.2. We have none. Item number three is the meetings held on the... Apologies for that. Item three is the meetings of... Um, minutes for the meeting held on the 16th of September 2022. Are members happy with them? Moved in by uh, Councillor Snape, seconded by uh, Councillor Smith. All in favour? Thank you. I'll just sign these and then, then it's, uh, it's done. Uh, say, say Kirsty chases after me for the next week saying, where's the minute? Thank you. And um, item number four, uh, and I think Claire's taking this, it's the... Uh, Minutes, sorry, Wildlife and Countryside Act 1981, Section 53, and this is a, a, an update on the applications policy. Thank you, Claire. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> so, yeah, the purpose of this report is just to explain the Council's process of dealing with Section 53 applications. At present, the Council deals with and works on applications as far as is practicable in the order in which applications were received. This is considered to be the fairest and most equitable mechanism with regards to all parties in the circumstances. This mechanism, however, has altered in the uh, recent years because the number of applications have been directed to be determined by the Secretary of State. The Council also recognises that in some instances the existence of an application that is awaiting determination could, in certain circumstances, have consequences for users um, and owners and occupiers. The impact of a delay in making a decision may have consequences that are significant for the parties involved. As a result of this, the panel determined at its meeting on the 4th of July 2019 to adopt and amend priority criteria which would allow for applicants and owners and occupiers to apply to have the application determined ahead of other applications which had been received before it. If that priority status is granted, then the application affecting that particular applicant or occupier would be dealt with as a priority. So there are a number of factors to consider when determining um, an, uh, the order in which an application is dealt with. And it would be helpful, therefore, for us to have a policy which we formally adopt, which clearly sets out the order in which these applications are dealt with. So the proposed policy would be um, that the Council shall endeavour to deal with applications in the order in which they've been accepted by the County Council, um, unless in the case of any particular application, the County has been directed by the Secretary of State to deal with that application first. These directed applications will then be prioritised, <coughs> excuse me, and the County will endeavour to deal with those applications in the order of the date set out by the Secretary of State. Secondly, the county has a policy which allows applicants to apply for priority status. The applications for priority will be determined by the Countryside and Rights of Way panel and if priority is granted, these applications will then be dealt with prior to those directed by the Secretary of State. The nature of the work um, on these applications means that some matters will take longer to be dealt with than others and it's not always possible to deal with them strictly in the order that they've been set out above. So consequently, consequently, some applications inevitably will be determined before others that have a, prior, a higher priority. This more flexible approach is considered to be the most efficient way of dealing with the current backlog. So in summary, the Council will deal with these applications. Firstly, applications which have been granted priority status. Secondly, applications which the County have been directed on by the Secretary of State. And thirdly, rem the remaining applications that don't fall within the above categories. Um, it, we, your officers consider that this um, policy is the, the fairest and most efficient way of dealing with resources and dealing with the applications. And therefore, our recommended option is to formally adopt this policy of dealing with applications as I have just referred to. 
Thank you, Claire. That's uh, fairly um, straightforward and uh, puts a little bit of order, or will put a little bit of order into how we deal with applications. Could I just ask, and it's perhaps a silly question, where do village green applications fall within the, that policy? They don't. <laughs> um, village greens have got, a, it's a separate um, matter. We do have a separate list of village green applications. So there is a list of, I, I couldn't tell you how many we've got on the list, but there is certainly a list of applications, but it's dealt with separately to section 53s. Yeah, so uh, just, just for my benefit, because it's something that's relevant in my, my ward, my division at the moment. How, how are the, the, the we'll come to important business in a minute, how are the village green applications uh, are dealt with in allotted time as well? So I think this is fairly important that we discuss both. Yeah, I, I, I don't think we have a formal policy in dealing. I think it's a similar, uh, it's something that I c can check up on. Um, I think we have a similar policy in that we deal with them in order of receipt. Um, but they're, they're, it's a resource issue at the moment in terms of dealing with village green applications. Um, so it, it may be something that we bring to a future panel in terms of a policy that is set at green. Uh, I, I totally accept the, the resource issue and just do the 153s is uh, beyond our present capacity uh, at the moment. So, so, and I have asked that cabinet member and leader um, have a meeting with me, which has not happened yet, um, I'm afraid. Uh, in terms of, of the Village Green one, let's just put that to bed. Could we have uh, an update come to an, uh, as a formal update to, to a, um, one of the upcoming um, uh, Crow panel meetings? I think we, we, we need sort of some clarity on it. Yeah, uh, that's not an issue. We can do something in this similar format to this so that yeah. we're clear as to what our process is in relation to Village Greens. If you would, please. No problem. Right, now ap apologies uh, for, for, set, for going off at a tangent there. Uh, have members got anything to say about the policy that's, that's just been um, put forwards by Claire? Jill? Just one question, Chair, thank you. Um, we can apply for, um, the, when they make an application, is it, would it still be the same process that they have to apply for priority status within 12 months? Is that the same? So what normally happens is an application is made. If within 12 months that application has not been determined, they can apply to the Secretary of State for a direction. The priority um, application, that process, is where it would affect maybe a landowner. If they're, for example, if they were selling their property and it's blighted by the right-of-way not being determined, that's a separate process and that's an internal process that the panel would deal with. But the 12 months would apply. You can apply for priority status as soon as you've applied made the application for the section 53 basically um it's the 12 months that would apply to the secretary of state for that determination okay paul myself and dave were part of the uh, 2019 decision making so uh, uh, we're totally well i'm totally in favor of it with the village greens really there's normally an awful lot more legal challenges to it it takes an awful lot so there's, there's often uh, independent reviews where we have to get barristers and stuff involved so that's why that's really that's why it's kept separate because it's just a totally different type of thing. Yeah. Say anything on this? No. Okay. So we've got a proposal in front of us from Claire, which which effectively tidies up the process. Um, I think it's a good idea. What what do can we have a vote on it? Do we agree? David, do you agree with this policy? Yeah. Unanimous. Uh, thank you, Claire. I understand you've got a, a prior appointment you've got to go to. Yeah, lovely. Thank you. I'll dash off. Thank, thank you. you. Right. Uh, thank you for that. And we'll move on now to uh, item number five, which is the Wildlife and Countryside Act 1981. Application for the addition of an alleged public footpath from Stevens Way to public footpath 31 at Audley. Uh, and I think this is you, Hannah, as is probably the next one as well. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, so, as stated, this is an application for the addition of an alleged public footpath um, from Stevens Way to public footpath 31 in the parish of Audley. Um, a, a copy of the line of the route can be seen at Appendix B. 
Um, so the application was submitted by Audley Parish Council and they submitted the application based on user and historical evidence. In support of the application was user evidence forms from 20 members of the public, a railway deposited plan and book of reference, ordinance survey maps and a statement from a previous landowner. So if I start with the user evidence. Um, so the user evidence needs to be considered under both statute and common law. So for the application to be successful, it will have to be shown that the public have used the alleged route as of right and without interruption for a period of at least 20 years prior to the status of the route being brought into question, or that it can be inferred by the landowner's conduct that they had actually dedicated the route as a public right of way and the right of way had been accepted by the public. In this case, there was no evidence that there has been any physical challenge to use of the route, and therefore the date of the application will be used as the, ch as the challenge date. Therefore, the relevant 20-year period is from 1996 to 2016. So 17 of the 20 users claim to have used the route for the relevant 20-year period that is required under statute. None of the users used force or sought permission to use the route. So for a presumption of dedication to be raised under statute, the amount of usage should be enough to bring home to a landowner that a right is being asserted across their land. In this case, the frequency of use could be said to be fairly regular, given that 10 of the users used the route weekly, three used it twice weekly, and two used it daily. Therefore, it can be argued that this level of use would have been sufficient to make a landowner aware that a, a right was being asserted over their land. When considering the remaining part of the statutory test, this considers whether the landowner has taken any action to rebut the statutory presumption of dedication. So again, in this case, there's no evidence um, been provided to show that any landowner has taken any action to prevent members of the public from accessing the route, and therefore that any action has been taken to rebut that statutory presumption of dedication. So the user evidence also needs to be considered under common law. So in this case, the user needs to prove the owner dedicated the route and the use does not need to be for 20 years. It is worth noting um, in this case that a previous landowner of a property affected by the application route has provided a statement um, confirming that at the time that they lived at this property, they were aware of the footpath's existence. They were aware at the time of living at the property that members of the public were using the alleged route as a footpath in an open way and without seeking permission on a daily basis. Although this does not cover the full 20-year period, um, as the owners lived in the property from 1977 to 2013, it does cover a significant period of the relevant 20 years. This also strongly reports the reputation of the route within the area. It further supports the contention that the route has been used by the public as of right and without interruption for an excess of 20 years. Now if I move on to the um, documentary evidence. So in considering the historical evidence, the railway deposited plan shows a route running along the same line as the alleged route. The route is not depicted as a highway or being separate from the adjacent land. The route runs through plot 153. The book of reference refers to occupation roads and a public footpath. So the way the route is depicted on the plan um, is more consistent with the route being a public footpath, although this is not conclusive. When looking at the 1890 and 1920 maps, they only support the physical existence of the route. So they do not provide any evidence in relation to the status or nature of any rights over the alleged route. The 1942 map, however, does depict a route along the line of the alleged route with the annotation FP above it. So this supports the contention that the route was a footpath. However, again, it does not provide any evidence as to whether the route was public or private. 
Um, so when we consider any evidence submitted by landowners, on submission of the application, one landowner did respond <coughs> um, stating that they did object to the application. To date, no response has been received from any statutory consultees other than correspondence has been received from the councillor for the area advising that they have no objection to the addition of the alleged footpath. So in considering the relevant legal tests in this case, the application is made under section 53, 3C1 of the Wildlife and Countryside Act 1981. So therefore, there are two tests to be considered, that of balance of probabilities, whether the route subsists, or reasonable allegation, whether it can reasonably be alleged that the route subsists. So to summarise, it is evident from the user evidence that well over 20 years usage of the route has taken place and there are no clear overt actions that have come to light that would indicate a clear intention not to dedicate. The evidence shows that the route has been used by a significant number of people on a fairly regular basis and evidence provided by previous landowners demonstrates that it was in excess of 20 years although not entirely within the relevant 20-year period. They were aware that the route was being used by the public as of right and no action was taken to prevent a presumption of dedication. Even when the landowners changed, there was no evidence that any specific action was taken to prevent members of the public from using the route. When the maps are considered alongside the railway deposited plans and book of reference, they do provide supporting evidence of the existence of a route that is more likely to have the status of a public footpath, but again, this is not conclusive. Overall, it is officer's opinion when that all of the evidence is reviewed in totality, it is sufficient to satisfy the test when considered on the balance of probabilities. And therefore, in relation to the second part of the test, this is also satisfied. Therefore, just to conclude, it is officer's opinion that the evidence shows that a public right of way with the status of footpath, which is not currently shown on the map and statement, subsists on the balance of probabilities, and therefore the alleged footpath should be added to the definitive map and statement. Thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Hannah. Um, have we any questions? It seems fairly sort of cut and dried. David. Yeah, I, I, I think the report's very comprehensive, but I was only interested, going back to point 27, where they talk about the 1942 map showing the yeah, existence of the route. It must presumably have existed before 1942. It wasn't there and then created. So it seems to me that there's evidence of, um, well, over 80 years of the existence of this route. And so I would... Uh, recommend that we approve the report, Chairman. Um, sorry, we've got a recommendation from David to approve. Paul? I would gladly second it. I mean, 1942, I suppose, is the strongest evidence. Actually, I've been the uh, in annotation FP on there as well. But there's all the, there's all the user use, there's no physical objections, uh, the cattle have gone etc when, when requested to it's it's an excellent report from Hannah so thank you very very much breaks it down it's one of the easiest ones we really have to deal with all the evidence really is in there it's been given to us today so I gladly second it so we've got a proposal from David seconder from Paul uh, you and me Jill I'm in favour okay so uh, we, we, the panel uh, accepts it should be added to the definitive map thank you Hannah um, don't go anywhere um, we're on to item number six, please, which is, uh, again, Wildlife and Countryside Act 1981. And it's an application for the addition of an alleged footpath from Public Footpath 23 Elliston along Green Lane to Public Footpath 3 Denston. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so as, as stated, this is the application for the addition of a public footpath. Um, so a copy of the line of the route can be seen at Appendix B. So the application was submitted by Mr Ray and it was submitted based on historical evidence. So in, in support of the application was evidence from the 1910 Finance Act, deposited railway plan dated 1845, a ram's horn tithe map dated 1847, 
a Prestwood tithe map dated 1844, an estate plan and various um, old maps. So if I start um, by considering the 1910 Finance Act material, um, so this material um, consists of a field book and map. So the map shows the alleged route um, depicted as Green Lane, um, as it is in modern day. So Green Lane is shown as being separate from adjacent land holdings, um, but also with two dotted lines running along um, the middle of the line of Green Lane. So the very southern end of Green Lane runs through plot 558. The field book for plot 558 has been provided and the field book refers to a public bridle road stopped at one end through OS 14 and a deduction is made of £25 um, for the public right of way. Um, OS 14 does form part of plot 558. Also, the field book does show that a deduction was made for a footpath through OS 14. When looking at the map, there is clearly a route running through plot 558 OS 14, which is shown as two dotted lines and with the annotation FP alongside it. Um, so therefore, we can conclude that this is not related um, to, the, the, to the alleged route. So the majority of Green Lane, the alleged route, runs through plots 559 and 143. Um, unfortunately, field books for these plots were not provided um, and therefore we, we cannot say for certainty um, as to the way the rest of the, the route is, is described or any deductions made for other public rights of way. The fact that the alleged route is shown separate from the adjacent land is suggestive that the route was a public highway. So where a route is de depicted in this way, it is likely that the route status would have been higher than a footpath or a bridle way. The fact that the route is depicted as separate from the adjacent land, but also has a route with two broken lines running in the middle of it, along with the description in the field book, does support the likelihood that this route was a highway, but also that it was quite likely a public bridle road, as referred to in the field book. If I move on to the 1845 deposited railway plan. So on the map accompanying this, there is a route again separate from adjacent land holdings and marked with the number 41. The book of reference refers to plot 41 and the description provided is occupation and public bridle road with the owners being Charles Walker and William Cox, surveyors of highways. So this evidence is supported, supportive that the route is public as an owner is, is recorded as the surveyor of highways and the surveyor would not have wanted to take on unwanted maintenance responsibilities. Although in this case there is poss the possibility that there was joint liability. So the documentation is supportive that the alleged route was an occupation road and had bridle rights over it therefore intimating that the rights over the alleged route would, would have been higher than just a footpath. So when the railway deposit pl deposited plan is reviewed alongside the 1910 Finance Act material, they do support each other in that the way the, the route is depicted on the plans shows that it was separate from the adjacent land and therefore significantly more likely to have had rights over it higher than a footpath. So the way the alleged route is depicted on the Finance Act map supports the, the description given in the Book of Reference with the deposited railway plan. So both documents support the contention that the route was an occupation road, but also it was a public bridle road, um, supporting the, the contention that the route might have at least had public bridle rights over it. So when we consider the tither documentation, so both the Ramshorn and Presswood tithe maps show the physical existence of the route. They both again show the route separate from the adjacent land. The Ramshorn tithe map does not have a key with the map or an apportionment. There's no number attached to the route and there's nothing to indicate the status or the nature of any rights over the alleged route. The Presswood tithe map numbers the alleged route as 47 and a small part of the route runs through plot 21. Again, there was no apportionment with the map, so no evidence as, as to the status of the route or the nature of any rights over the route. 
And um, it also appears that the, sta the estate plan submitted with the application has been copied from the Presswood Tithe map. So the fact that both maps show the alleged route is separate from the adjacent land is suggestive that the route is right over at higher than a footpath or even possibly a bridleway. But there is no conclusive evidence um, when considering the tithe evidence um, as to the nature of any rights over the alleged route or whether the route is public or private. When reviewing the old maps, um, all of the old maps submitted with the application again show the physical existence of the route. Again, however, there is nothing from the maps to indicate the status of the route or the nature of any rights over the alleged route and therefore they do not assist with the application either way. So correspondence was received from Denston Parish Council in May 2000 advising that the route was a well-made track on the JCB estate and it links to the end of Public Footpath 3, three Denston. They advised that they had no objections to the route being added Further correspondence was then received from the, camp, the Parish Council in August 2001, advising that at West House Lane, a padlocked gate had been installed and a notice saying, private land, no access without permission, had been put up. They again advised that this section of Green Lane is a well-made track and without access to it um, for walkers, footpath three would have no purpose. The Byways and Bridleways Trust also responded to the application, saying that they were of the opinion that the historical evidence presented justified a higher status than a footpath. They were of the view that the route is an old cart road. So following circulation of the report, comments were received from the legal representatives, um, Hill Dickinson, LLP, of the landowners, Bath Property Limited, object objecting to the inclusion of the route. So their arguments are that there was no evidence in the, in the 1910 Finance Act plans relating to the majority of the claimed route in the field book entry for plot 558 does not relate to the, the alleged route. They have said in the alternative that if the alleged route does lie in plot 558, the reference in the field book for plot 558 to a public bridle road does not necessarily relate to the alleged route, they state that the reference could relate to Paul's Lane. They've also stated that the field book refers to the public bridle road being stopped up and therefore ceasing to exist as a public bridle road, which they argue is supported by the deposited railway plan. They further state that the abstract of title supports the view that the claimed route is a private right of way and not a public right of way. They confirmed that the, the route has been gated at its northern and southern ends with the gates being locked at night. So it's officer's opinion that the southern part of the alleged route does run through plot 558. It's also officer's opinion that the public bridle road referred to in the field book is most likely to refer to the alleged route. Paul's Lane does not run through OS 14 and therefore it is unlikely that the deduction referred to in the field book relates to Paul's Lane. In relation to the field book referring to the public bridleway being stopped at one end, officers are of the view that this does not automatically mean that the route has been stopped up in the sense that it's been extinguished but the, the route terminated at one end. Also the purpose of Finance Act documentation is not to legally extinguish routes and therefore it does not have the same evidential weight as a quarter session order or an extinguishment order itself. Following circulation of the report, we also received further comments from Denston Parish Council, who support the application for Green Lane to be designated as a public right of way, but they are of the view for it to be useful, um, public footpath th three would also need to be reclassified as a bridal way. They note um, that concerns have also been raised about four by four access, um, but they believe that this can be controlled <laughs> by a, a suitable gate at the, at the north end of Green Lane. So when we consider the, the relevant legal tests in this case, the application is made under section 53, 3C1 of the Wildlife and Countryside Act 1981. So again, there are two tests to be considered, that a balance of probabilities, whether the route subsists, 
or reasonable allegation whether it can reasonably be alleged that the route subsists. Um, so just to summarise, the Finance Act Material and Railway Deposited Plan do provide evidence and quite supporting evidence of the route's existence as a public highway as it is shown separate from the adjacent land and therefore that the route was also considered to be a public bridle road supporting the route status as a bridle way. So it's, it's clearly noted that the applicant has applied for the route to be added to the definitive map and statement as a public footpath. However, on review of the evidence, officers have concluded that the evidence actually supports the contention of the route having rights over it higher than just a footpath due to the way it's depicted in the Finance Act material and the Deposited Railway Plan. So therefore, officers would put forward the recommendation to actually add the route to the definitive map and statement as a public bridle way, as the evidence would support bridle rights over the, the alleged route. So it's open to the panel when considering the application to come to a, de a decision on the matter other than that which is the subject of the application. So therefore it is open to the panel today to accept the application as it is, to add the route as a public footpath, to accept rec officers' recommendation to add the route as a public bridle way, um, or of course to reject the application in its entirety. Um, thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, slightly more complicated than the last application. Um, just, just for clarity, has there been any uh, representation from local members? Um, we have been, no, um, we have had acknowledgement from the council of the of the application and the, the draft report that was sent out. So, so no, no comment from local members? No. Okay. Now, um, the Parish Council support the footpath. What was their thoughts on the bridleway? Um, so really all they stated was that they supported the, the route being added as, um, as, a, public, um, as a public right of way. Um, so really... Um, they didn't provide a, a clear response regarding the public bridal way. I think obviously their concern was if it, the route was added as a public bridal way because it connects to a public footpath, um, that would potentially create issues as it wouldn't be, it wouldn't create um, the, the same connection with the same status. Um, but they haven't specifically said that they are against it being um, made as a public bridal way. They've just um, raised the issue that it would connect to a public, um, a public footpath. Okay, thank you. And finally, uh, the Borough Council, I read in, in the application, you didn't mention, uh, you may have mentioned it, uh, they've, they've got no objection uh, to, to the application. Yeah, we've not received anything <coughs> from them to say that they object to the application. Okay, so members, comments? I, th I think we can't just move it. We've got, we've got two stages to this. First of all, uh, we've got to just discuss the bridleway status um, and, and then, then move it. Paul? Okay, another very comprehensive report. Uh, as you say, a bit more difficult than the last one. But as it's now been decided or we've been discovered with the evidence gathered that it's a bridleway, I think we've got to go with the bridleway. Uh, that's what the road, uh, bridle road, that was what was, it was decreed many years ago. I think we've got to go with that. If we don't, there's a likelihood that the people who've met the application, Mr Ray, can come back and say that we've uh, discovered that the, the road, uh, the public footpath should be put on a definitive map, but it's actually a bridleway. So I really think we've got to go with the bridleway. All the evidence is there uh, under the Right Act, it's been applied for. The Finance Act, the railway plans, etc., show what it is. Uh, so I really believe we've got to go with Bridleway, and that's what uh, I'll make a proposal with. C can I just ask for clarification? Is that correct? Because my understanding was that the, the maps actually say it's a higher than a footpath, but don't state Bridleway. Um, so there is evidence from both the, um, the Finance Act material and the Deposited Railway Plan. Um, so in the book of reference that accompanies the... Um, 
the deposited railway plan, it refers to, in relation to the, the alleged route, the, the route that runs on the same line as the alleged route, occupation and public footpath. So when reviewing the, the deposited railway plan map and reviewing the, the reference made in the book of reference, the uh, depiction on the map most um, consists with the, the definition public bridal, bridal road. So that's kind of how our decision was reached. Thank you. Jill? Thank you, Chair. Yeah, um, I'd agree with Councillor Snape. Um, I think there's enough supporting evidence for the footpath and also for a public right of way, so I would be happy to support the officer's recommendations. Thank you. David. I'm sorry, I, I was working on the basis that the you know, recommendation um, is sufficient to conclude that a public bridleway, which is not shown on the map, is reasonably alleged to subsist, and I'm supporting that argument. So, so we've got a proposal from Paul that we accept the application for, to go on the definitive route and that that application actually states that um, it, it's, it's higher than the footpath, it's actually a bridleway. Is that correct? Yeah? Okay. And David, you, you're supporting, supporting that, as is Jill. Um, I have some concerns about the bridleway because it actually, re it, it actually um, joins up with footpath number three, I think, which is, a, which is, which is uh, not the bridleway. So I'm going to um, uh, abstain from the vote on, on, on the, on the bridleway part. Um, but I agree with the footpath bit. So can we first of all have a vote on, do we think it should be a, a bridleway? Okay, so, so we're now voting on it as a bridleway. Um, I will abstain because of the, the reasons I've just given. But uh, can I show of hands, please? To, to, to agree that they should be on the definitive map as a bridal way. Okay, we've got three members who agree with that. One abstains, which is myself. Um, thank you, Hannah, for an interesting report and uh, interesting results as well. Thank you. Uh, we move now, please, to exclusion of the public. Have we got any exclusions, Kirsty? No? Okay, so uh, we'll finish the meeting um, my, at, at uh, 10.37. Thank you very much, uh, Hannah, uh, Laura, and um, Kirsty, and Zach. Got it right. Uh, and, and members, obviously, for, for attending and, and uh, an interesting meeting. Thank you very much, and we'll close the meeting now. Are we...